My name is Alison Stevens. I'm now 51 years of age and I converted to Islam when I was uh, 47. I was born in England, but my parents are Irish Scots. My father was in the oil industry, so we moved all over the place. Uh, so I don't have any fixed roots anywhere, really. And we eventually ended up in Scotland in the early 70s. Apart from going to church services with the school at, at Christmas time, uh, there was no uh, religious upbringing at home at all. Secondary education was uh, mostly in Scotland. And again, there was uh, uh, compulsory religious education lessons. Uh, but we all resented, very much resented going to those because at that point, really most of us were secular and didn't see any need for religion and certainly didn't enjoy going to the church services that we had to go to at Christmas time. Uh, we respected religious, I've, I've always respected um, religious people, um, but uh, for me it was not necessary. I didn't feel any particular yearning. To be honest, I felt religion caused a lot of problems um, and I was more interested in the human condition and caring for human beings. I called myself atheist. I was more 99% atheist, but there was this tiny little bit of me that couldn't quite call itself completely atheist. That's the whole beauty of the thing. I wasn't actually looking at religion at all. My hospital had recruited some people who were very evangelical Christians, and in fact, they were putting me really off of religion, completely. They were actually driving me away totally. And I'd got to the stage where actually I'd, my, you know, I'd written in my will that I wanted a non-religious burial, etc., etc. But what happened was um, every day when I went to work, they had the Bible open and they would quote bits of the Bible at myself and as other non-believers and would go on and on and uh, I don't know, in, retali in retaliation in a way, I was out in Richmond and I bought a lot of books. I bought the Quran, the Torah, 365 sayings of the Dalai Lama, and of course, how to be an atheist. So when they got to work on the Monday, I lined the books up next to theirs, and of course, when they saw this, I'm saying, well, seeing as you're so interested in religion, I felt it was time you broadened your horizons. I was so angry at them because they were splitting the unit and causing a lot of problems. And within a few days, they asked me to remove the books. And they promised they would no longer talk to any of us about religion. Fine. And I took the books home and was just flicking through them very quickly. And again, didn't feel anything particular, but I opened up the Quran thinking, okay, let's just see what this is all about. Quickly scanned through the first chapters and the first thing I read was, oh, the women. Oh, I'll read this, I'll read this. Opened it up and started reading it. And, um, Quite emotional, sorry. The shock was quite profound. Even now, it still is quite profound. <laughs> anyway, I remember reading the words and thinking, well, this isn't what I expected. And uh, I read a bit more and thought, uh, I can't believe what I'm reading. So I shut the book and thought, okay, I've read a bit now, that will do me. Um, but I couldn't stop reading it. So <clears throat> a few days later, I decided to read from the front. It was just wonderful. <laughs> it was uh, so gentle, but very profound. It was very powerful, just reading the words. Uh, I desperately tried to rationalize it and uh, kept reading. And the more I read, the more it made sense. And as I say, it really was like a light had been turned on. Very bizarre for somebody who'd been so against religion. And I remember trying desperately not to believe what I was reading, resisting it. And at one point closing the Quran and thinking, I'm never gonna read this anymore. I'm not gonna read anymore, but I couldn't help myself. Um, it was a very 
um, strong thing, very strong. So after reading a few chapters, I thought, well, maybe my translation is wrong. And I decided to visit a mosque. I made the choice of choosing a mosque far away from where I live, because I didn't want anyone to see me. And I went to the masjid and uh, pulled on a scarf and everything. <laughs> and met this imam who confirmed that what I was reading was the, not the most beautiful of translations, he said, but actually was accurate. Um, and I remember him saying, are you planning to convert? I said, oh, certainly not. I've just come about the book, you know. And I tried to make it some sort of intellectual exercise, but there was something deep inside that was changing, very, quite dramatically. And I got home that particular day, and I remember the imam kept saying to me it was a very special day, and I'm going, yes, I know, yes, it's a special day, and got home and turned on the television, and of course, again, vowing, right, I've done that now, I'm going to walk away from this. And it was the Prophet Muhammad's birthday that day. So how can you ignore something like that? <laughs> so a few days later, I came to work, and I took aside one of my Muslim colleagues, who's a, a doctor, and... Uh, she, was, uh, she thought I was going to tell her something dreadful about a patient, something awful had happened. And when I told her, she was uh, in quite, shock, quite a big shock, because I said, I don't know what to do. Um, and she then gently guided me. I, wasn't, I didn't feel coerced or forced. It was very much a decision that I wanted to make. I questioned myself constantly. Was this some sort of middle-aged crisis? was I, uh, you know, at one point I thought maybe I should just become a Christian because that was more traditional, but I just knew that wasn't right for me. So after a few weeks with her, I did my shahada, but I did it completely voluntary. There was no, I just felt inside it was right. Libya, uh, had a small influence on my conversion. When I went there, um, the people were very friendly. They were very um, hospitable, uh, very open. One of the things that impressed me was I went to one place where they had an old church that had been deserted for a long time, but the, the, the locals felt it their duty to keep the church in order, even though it hadn't been used for over 40 years. Um, they were very curious to know about um, me and my thoughts and what kind of lifestyle I had. Um, and of course the sound of the call to prayer actually was quite magical as well. When I went on um, one of my visits to Libya, I went to the desert. Um, I'd written to the agent ahead and said that I wanted to be um, with as few people as possible. Uh, according to the guidebook where I was going, there was convoys of tourists, but actually that wasn't true. And he organized for me to drive with this uh, Bedouin driver and uh, a Tuareg cook. And I went with a friend and uh, had a fantastic time. It's the best holiday I've ever had. I've never laughed so much. I don't know if it's the fresh air or what, um, the little driver that I had, uh, his name was Mohammed, did not speak any English, well, about four words, and uh, it was perfect. Um, as I left the village where he lived, he took my mobile number, and I said, you know, goodbye, Masala. A few months later, I, as you know, I was back in Britain, and a few months later, I actually then converted to Islam. But again, there was no relationship at this point with, with Libya as such. Um, about five months after I'd done my shahada, um, I get this little text, and this chap, Mohammed uh, Aywadat, had arrived in the UK to study English. He was completely unaware of what was going on in my life. Of course, we met up, and of course, when I told him I'd converted to Islam, well, that was it. He decided that he'd been sent here to look after me, and he was now my protector, and he decided He's my brother. And I kept going, yeah, Islamically. He goes, no, no, I really am your brother now. And through him, of course, um, 
when I went back, to, I got invited to his wedding and, of course, met all the rest of the family, and the bonds became closer and closer and closer. And, uh, of course, those bonds now are very, very strong. So this is why I refer to them as my Islamic family, because we've got no blood relationship at all. There's no marriage relationship, but um, when I go there, I'm very much part of the family. The only thing I'm going to do in the few, next few years is um, add the family names to my name. But I'm keeping my name Alison, because Alison is a very honourable name. Um, but as it, I'm going to be changing my deed poll and adding their family name into my name. I've asked their permission and they're very, very happy about this. The thing about the uh, Islamic family I want to add is, uh, obviously when they first got in touch, I thought, what are you after? But they've had nothing from me. Um, in fact, Mohammed Ayyadat, for a long time, even when he was living in the UK, didn't come and stay with me because he didn't want to be seen to be taking advantage. Um, so they, they get nothing from me. So, you know, it's, it's a purely a, a, um, a spiritual thing with us, really. This is the main entrance to the hospital that I work at, and I've been working here for 10 years. It's just a typical uh, National Health Service hospital. Very busy, very busy. Uh, and we're now just going off to uh, a local restaurant, a uh, fantastic Lebanese restaurant, with, uh, where we're going to meet my friends. The first day I went to the mosque, actually, to be honest, um, uh, I spoke to an imam, who, and I asked if I'd got a correct translation of the Quran, because, uh, you know, I thought maybe there'd been a mistake, but no, there wasn't. Shortly after I arrived, and uh, the door was opened, and a gentleman walked in, and English, and uh, the uh, Imam asked him to stay. This gentleman has actually been very pivotal and very helpful in my conversion. But at the time, of course, we, we didn't know this was going to evolve into anything. And I remember him saying that, uh, was I planning to convert? And I said, certainly not, I, I'm just here for information. And he then uh, uh, said to me, well, if I was planning to convert, that if I'd come to Islam looking for friendship or looking for the best in humankind, I wouldn't find it. <laughs> and that uh, Islam was, was not a utopia. And I said I had no illusions about Islam because of uh, some of the things that had happened to me in my nursing career. He was very good because he gave me some quick references for books to read and, uh, and left. Of course, uh, I rang him a few months later to tell him that I had actually taken my shahada. Islam has changed me as a wife. It's made me very determined to keep the marriage going. And actually, thanks to uh, some advice from my imam and because of things I've read in the Quran, the, the marriage is still going. I think, in fact, I'm pretty sure if I'd stayed secular, we would not be married now. Um, and I try to see things from his point of view as well. But he now also tries to see things from my point of view. And I'm actually, because I'm stronger and more confident, um, he's now more willing to help me. Before he wouldn't help me at all. And I think secretly he's quite proud, even though he doesn't want to admit it. <laughs> So this is one of my favourite restaurants, um, Lebanese. And uh, actually I came here with Rukhaya uh, quite a few years ago when it, when it was just a very small restaurant and now it's expanded. It does the best hummus in the world. My name is Rukhaya and I'm a friend of Alison's. Um, how long I think? It's been about, what, four well, years? Here in 2007. Is it really? Okay. I met her in 2007. She has a better memory than I do. And we were, I was asked to meet her because my daughter was going to an Islamic school in Egham. And one of the girls said, Miriam actually, wasn't it? Yes. Would you mind meeting up with uh, Alison and having a chat? So I said, yeah, okay, that's not too bad. And I've been doing this for the community anyway, just been supporting uh, Muslims that just converted. So uh, we met at Hanslow Mosque. 
Yeah. And but we talked about Islam outside yeah. the mosque, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. And the only thing I can remember saying to you is, the only advice I can give you, because I can give you none, is just a word of warning that you'll get, a, as soon as you converted, you get these loads of people saying to you, do this, do this, do this that. is haram, this is halal, this is, you know, and it's almost like a rule book. And, and I said, sometimes you just need to take a step back and I said, don't listen to everything, just acknowledge it, be polite, and then ask them either to confirm it with the Sunnah or the, with the Quran, or if not, then confirm it within your own heart, really, if it resonates with you and it feels pretty cool. I said, because they can drive you absolutely mad and you get told so many different lies or discrepancies that it drives you, you know, okay, what is, what is this, what is that? Not to rush things, because <coughs> to make any kind of changes in your life, it takes time anyway. You've got to adjust. If you adjust too quickly, then you can't take on the beauty of Islam. It's, just quite, it's quite simple. If you do it in short bite-sized steps, steps, gentle little steps, and then you can appreciate all those changes that are happening to you spiritually. If you rush right in, like a bull in a china shop, you'll crush a few items along the way and you may actually miss some of the beauty that surrounds Islam. Actually, I find it very empowering and for me, it's given me a lot of freedom. It freed up my thought. I'm not afraid to open up my heart and feel things now. If you look at how the history of Islam, they were the first ones to think of you, to uh, build universities, to encourage learning and thinking. And of course, the other thing I didn't realise is, you know, your local masjid is not just a, a place of prayer, it's also a, a place where people go to uh, learn. Uh, the Regent's Park Mosque has a huge library, for example, full of books, you know, and a huge courtyard where people can stand and discuss matters. So, over the years, I've come across other converts, but um, one in particular, um, I was in a bookstore, and uh, I could hear this girl talking excitedly on the other side of this bookshelf, and a uh, very English voice, and I sort of popped my head over, and there she was with niqab and everything and uh, of course she was shocked when I said well actually I'm Muslim too and uh, she was going way off the path and I remember taking her to Regent's Park Mosque to meet my imam and she actually argued with him constantly I think one of the things that really hurt me was she was saying how um, her mother was quite Christian and had done the Christian Lord's Prayer in front of her and she had stopped her mother doing this and I said well that's not Islamic behavior at all and if you listen to what the Christian prayer is and our prayer is almost identical what it's asking for and um, to hurt your mother is just so against Islamic belief anyway this girl became uh, quite f fanatical uh, in the long run we she actually left Islam but now is vehemently, she says she's sort of really against Islam now. Um, because she's, she joined it as a form of rebellion and of course discovered that actually most Muslims just get on with their lives and have the same core beliefs as everybody else really. And uh, you know, she didn't find what she was looking for. So that was sad, very sad. Muslims don't, it sounds silly, but they don't tend to integrate. Uh, they don't. They don't invite people round for, to break fast, for example. During Ramadan would be a really good excuse to get a non-Muslim co colleague or friend to come and break fast with you, because it's a great event. Uh, and to see that Muslims are just the same as everybody else. They, they want to have get married and have children and have a good life and they, they live by the same rules. They're also part of the same tree, if you like. They're <laughs> I remember shocking somebody once when I said, well, really, we're like extended Christians. We have exactly the same beliefs, really. We also believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and we share the same values. We share the same core values. Um, it's a bit like in the 80s, don't forget, my, my family are also Irish background. 
And I remember um, he didn't like to bring up the fact that you had Irish in you at one point in the 80s because, of course, the IRA were bombing us. So maybe it's just a phase. And of course, now everybody loves the Irish. Everybody loves the Irish, which is great. But maybe that's what we need to do. Is it, Unfortunately, it'll be a phase that we have to go through. Um, and I think the tide is turning. I think people realize that the people that commit terrorism are a minority. Sadly, they, uh, it's very sad. And I think um, hopefully the moderate voice is getting heard more. I think the other problem is our media tends to focus very much and gives a lot of coverage to the fundamentalist or the extreme view. And people like me are a bit boring and a bit moderate and they don't, they're not interested in people like me, <laughs> you know? Uh, although I worked in a very, you know, as a nurse you're supposed to be compassionate, my heart really wasn't in it. Uh, it was sort of going through the motions without really feeling it. I'm actually uh, much more compassionate and understanding than I ever was. Um, I'm much more patient than I was. I still have a little bit of a temper, but I try to, for the sake of uh, my, uh, for the sake of my religion, or for the try, when I think about the Prophet peace be upon him, Muhammad, I try to control my temper a little bit more now. Um, I haven't lost my sense of humour. Um, I remember I didn't feel like, I didn't want to sort of run around and say, hey, guess what happened to me? And I kept it very dignified and very quiet, not because I was ashamed or because I didn't want to talk about it, but because it was something so personal to me. And I'd been, uh, I was at work, and it was my first time I did Ramadan, and uh, my colleagues were saying, oh, did you want a cup of tea? I said, no, no, I'm all right. And, and when one of them jokes, says, what, are you fasting? Are you a Muslim? Joking. And I said, Yes, I am actually, and this was the first opportunity I'd had to actually talk about this. Now, this has been six months. I'd been converted for nearly six months at this point, and there was this shock silence in the operating theatre, absolute shock silence. And somebody said, you shouldn't joke about something like that. I said, I'm not joking. And the surgeon actually dropped an instrument because of the shock, because please remember I'd been atheist, more or less. And uh, there was a bit of a sort of embarrassed coughing, and then they carried on. And um, they said, oh, you know, there was just this silence. So they, we then carried on working. Later that day, I went down to the coffee room to get one of the surgeons to come back to work and uh, trotted down into the coffee room. And as I walked in, you could hear everybody talking, walked in and complete silence, complete silence. And uh, OK, one of my colleagues then joked, well, she hasn't got a backpack on, as a joke. And it's just made everybody laugh. And of course they then said, is this really true? And I said, yes, it's really, really true. And one of them said, but you haven't changed. And I said, well, why would I change? And then one of them said, she doesn't swear as much. And that's the only change they'd noticed. <laughs> and that was it. But the thing is, I'd kept my sense of humor, although, uh, you know, uh, I don't like crude sense of humour, but I never have. Uh, and that was it. That was the only change. This is uh, the Quran that I refer to most often. It's uh, Al Quran by Ahmed Ali, and it's a contemporary translation. And uh, again, this is the Quran that I first went to Regent's Park Mosque with. Um, just to stress, it, it isn't the most beautiful of translations, as they've said, but it's got beautiful footnotes and uh, very, uh, not easy to read, but it's uh, written in a beautiful language. Uh, this is from the family of Imram 3129. Remember, to all God belongs all that is in the heavens and the earth. He may pardon whom he pleases, and he will punish whom he will. Yet he is God, and he is forgiving and kind. And finally, something I hold firm to, because uh, it's very easy to get into arguments with people. And simply it's this, remember, to you your way, and to me my way. <laughs>